What's up, Dan? What's up, Joy Man? How you doing? Oh, uh, good, man. Good to have you here. Great to be on. Great to be on. It's Thank you for been having me. A long time. It has. You know, I found a photo of me and you actually the other day in Miami at, uh, I believe, the Big Beat pool party. Wow. I think that's one of the last times I saw you in the flesh, you know? So except for like, yeah. you know, in passing at Amsterdam dance event. But yeah, yeah. I actually good to see you face a, to face. I actually had a really, really bad sunburn from, uh, from, that, from that pool party. What, and you think I got a tan? Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think I, happened here? I remember, I, I still remember I was there with friends and the sun was shining on one side and I constantly kept looking at that. So this side completely got burned and this side was normal. So I sticked around the whole week with this like sun tattoo in my neck. Gotta love it, gotta love it. Yeah, man, gotta love Miami. But it's, I, I think that's been so long. Yeah, I, that's the last time. What, what were you doing at that time? Because I recall you working for Dancing Astronauts. Yes, uh, so I was still working for Dancing Astronaut at that time, and that was actually the summer, or technically the year, that I started working in music full-time. So while I was in Miami, I had a, a job interview actually with Mark Knight, and I went and joined his team uh, just for a set really? a set contract. And yeah, so I was his head of marketing and promotions. For, for touring? For, for Mark Knight himself. So okay, they, okay. they kept it as two separate business entities. So that was really exciting because, you know, I went from, I was living a double life at that time. I was sort of, in the day I was working in uh, London in sort of, you know, a communications role at a facilities management company, like, you know, wearing a three-piece suit and tie kind of thing. And then in the evenings I was like writing, I was working with Steve Angelo and T.S. Stowe as a copywriter and a general content strategist. I, I was doing the dancing astronaut thing. And then at the weekends I was either flying out to Stockholm or Am Amsterdam, usually with, you know, artists or clients. So, you know, to, that was the year I went full time in music and it felt really good because suddenly I could sleep more. <laughs> you know, I wasn't, you know, it's like, you know, there's that scene in Batman where, you know, Christian Bale's covered in bruises and it's like, you know, know your limits. Like, I think it was around that time I was working out my limits. So it was, it felt pretty liberating to make that switch there and then. And, you know, um, I've been, I've been here since. So what, that's like, that's four years ago. So, you know, it was four years ago. Yeah. That was the, was it the first or the second? I think it was my first time in Miami. I still remember yeah. that was the year where chain smokers kind of broke through. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. At, at that pool think, party, they had that selfie boards. Remember, they they went through with yes. the selfie things. No, man, exactly. It was uh, I was a uh, I was a pretty crazy year. And when I look back at 2014, like not just for me personally, I think so many artists and professionals had sort of um, laid a lot of groundwork up until then. And I think obviously, you know, we had guys like Swedish House Mafia and Avicii and Calvin Harris really finding that commercial kind of depth and I, I felt like people started taking something I'd been doing for a long time or something I'd been advocating for a long time seriously on a global level yeah. so you know I my friends used to like take the piss out of me for being the guy that was geeking out about dance music and stuff and then suddenly you know I'm in Miami working or I'm you know going full-time and that was the same year I actually uh, moved to Stockholm and joined at night management and you know it suddenly it was like a uh, see we weren't we weren't just messing around this was yeah. a this was a serious thing. So it was, it was a liberating year, 2014. I love that year. I look, I look back on that very fondly. Yeah, me too, man. To me, it's, it's kind of double because on one hand, it was my most successful year. I had the biggest tour. Like I played Tomorrowland, Ibiza, all, the, the whole world. And Joey same, Suki. Yeah, Joey Suki. And at the same time, it was the year where, where, I were, where I was so freaking unhappy. That was the year I actually decided to quit. 2014. Okay. Yeah, so to me it's double, but for the music industry, it was it definitely was a great time. I think it's always, I think, I don't know, I, I get sick of people saying, oh, the music industry sucks, oh, the music industry this, the music industry that, like, you know what, every industry worth working in sucks at one point or another, yeah. and the thing is, it's always changing, and I, I have a theory that people say they like change when they're being interviewed on podcasts or doing, you know, like these medium blog posts and stuff, like, Really, nobody likes change. No. So when things start changing, people get uncomfortable. Yeah. And quite frankly, you know, I talk to people who have been working in this industry for 10, 15, 20 plus years. And those are the people I really respect because they weathered it out. You know what? Like mm -hmm. there are people who probably thought their whole businesses were absolutely fucked because, they you know, yeah, and, but they adapt. 
so they stopped selling CDs and they went to you know streaming. And mm-hmm. yeah, you know what I mean. I think it's that you've got to be willing to be uncomfortable but see it through. You know, mm-hmm. and uh, I think the people that can do that are the people that have long and prosperous careers. Yeah, I totally, I totally agree with that. Especially as an entrepreneur, you know, like you just have to, you have to adapt because otherwise you, you won't survive. And especially if you see what happened in the music industry in the past ten years, fifteen years. I actually just just one guy asked me on the live stream on Instagram, like, how do you see the the music industry evolving in the next fifteen years? If you if you see what happened in the past fifteen years. Wow, mm. it's just a completely different industry, you know. Like 15 years ago, people actually still bought CDs. They still went to music shops to buy to buy CDs. Right now, like everything's changed. Streaming, yeah. YouTube, Spotify, all those things. It's just as as a, as a businessman, as as a label owner, you you yeah. If you didn't change, you you died. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, for, for better and for worse, right? Yeah, exactly. So take me a bit deeper into what you're doing right now because you've worked for Mark Knight uh, as a, a marketing manager, right? Absolutely. And then um, off the back of that, I went to At Night Management. Mm-hmm. I worked as their head of marketing and PR for two years. Is that the, and then, where, uh, is that the, the, the company where Avicii was signed as well? Yeah, so at the At Night family consisted of uh, Avicii. We also had Axel and Grosso for some time too. Otto Knows, Kazette, uh, the hip-hop artist Ishii, and within that I also worked very closely on the label side for PRMD Records, mm-hmm. so uh, which was great, and you know, I had a wonderful couple of years there, amazing team on both sides of the business, learned, learned a lot, and yeah, and then in 2016 I, uh, I decided it was, I kind of wanted to do something that A, that I could own, kind of the, the whole process, and kind of move my business, you know, I think I don't, we were just talking about this before about, you know, sort of working for yourself versus working for someone else. And I, I personally don't mind working for someone else, but I think once you start working for yourself and realize that you have this autonomy just to get shit done that needs to be done and not have to ask someone's permission or get sign off or, you know, I think once you work out that that is the way you work best, you never want to go back to it. So for me, you know, it was too- I, I felt like I wanted to have a bit more control, and at the same time, I wanted to focus a bit more on pop music because so much of what I'd done over those two years had taken me into markets I didn't really think I'd be working in, you know. And we'd had our, our first hip hop artist with Ishi, which opened the doors to a whole new crowd and a whole new market. And then, you know, stuff like from, from Otto Nose and Kazette was crossing over, and of course, you know, the Avicii project by all intents and purposes was the ultimate crossover project. So I wanted to take a lot of that momentum and put it into my own roster and that's how um, my company above board entertainment group was born uh, I, I say that's how it was born i didn't actually plan to set up a company in, in the time that i was saying okay i should work out what i'm going to do next i suddenly uh took on a bunch of clients and went oh shit no i really need a company because i need to start sending invoices yeah and stuff. Exactly. so you know i, I need I, a name I, to put on the invoice yeah, exactly, man. So, you know, I was, I'm very much the accidental entrepreneur. And I mean, I, people refer to me as an entrepreneur and I kind of, uh, I cast it off. I, I don't like that word necessarily. I think it, it's become something that people try too hard to sort of market and push. But, you know, generally speaking, I, I've been blessed with the opportunity to set up a company that, you know, A, can do what needs to be done for clients, that can do, you know, the marketing and sort of publicity and general sort of digital principles of an artist's career mm-hmm. in however much or however little, little they need. And that for me is really powerful because, you know, so often people won't want to work with you because they don't quite, they think you're either going to do too much for them or they don't think there's enough you can do for them. And what I've constantly been able to do is find a way that allows me to work with artists long term. And that for me is important. You know, I, I like seeing artists grow. I think artist development generally is one of the most important and underlooked skills in the music industry. And it's something I'm incredibly passionate about, uh, even more so now that I have my own company and platform in which to do that. So, you know, it's, uh, it's been really exciting. And so what I, I think what I kind of specialize in now is that overall artist development and putting putting artists in the right place and uh, that can be mm-hmm. in terms of the publicity that can be in terms of with streaming partners that can be in terms of you know developing 
brand principles that start reflecting with an audience. And I think what it all comes down to, and it took me a long time to realize this, is so much of what I have to do well is help artists identify who their fans are. Yeah. Because I think I think the move to digital and the heavy emphasis on social media and, you know, the fact that everybody looks at the numbers first and foremost, to me that is dangerous because quite often we're pointing to numbers without remembering that each of those digits, each of those one units of whatever number represents a fan or in the ideal world represents a person that is there consuming the music. Music is not consumed by a bunch of fucking digits. Music is yeah. consumed by human beings. And part of the challenge I like is that we're going to like, right, what do those digits, what do these people do when they're not listening to music? How do we engage them? And how do we become part of their mm-hmm. life? You know what I mean? And I don't have the definite answer to that, you know, even <laughs> all these years in marketing, that's what keeps it interesting I, for me. I'm, I'm really interested in your opinion on this. Regarding the Spotify part, you know, like you mentioned the the uh, the, the the likes, you know, like the the clicks they have, the streams. In my opinion, like the streams you have on Spotify isn't the right, um, doesn't reflect on how big your fan base is. I'll explain why. Spotify is being used by a lot of consumers, of course, and they consume music in different kinds of way. When I listen to Spotify, I pick. I specifically pick the music I want to listen to because I like music. So I know what I'm listening to, which artist, which track, whatever. So my play is definitely worth being named as a fan. But I think most people listening on Spotify uh, consume music on the background. They just follow their favorite playlist, click play, the playlist starts playing and they don't even, they aren't even aware of the fact what they're listening to. They are listening to the playlist but they don't know which artist is connected to that track or whatever. So I'm, the golden question, I think you, you're absolutely right. The golden question is like, how many times does somebody have to hear a track until they feel compelled to take their phone out of the This is reality. The heavy duty users are either on computer and it's in the background or on mobile and it's in your pocket. How many plays does it take for them to commit to wanting to find out who the artist behind that song is yeah. and this is a uh, this is something i've been talking with so many people about and you know it like you say it just just having a lot of streams isn't enough if you know what i mean and that's that's mm. not to shit on people that are focusing on spotify and like that of course i think i welcome what spotify has brought and the dynamic it's brought to the digital <laughs> music market like, so much because I just think it's helping a lot of artists get discovered. And I, you know, that's the thing, right? People who aren't getting those streams aren't in that system yet, they'll say that it's not fair and they don't like it and that. But, you know, for me, I've not only been able to work with A-list artists at the streaming platform, newcomers like Sean Martin, we introduced her to the market from scratch in the And we're she's losing, a completely independent artist. We're losing the connection for a little. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's better. Okay, so um, the Spotify part. Yeah, plays versus fans. You know, like my opinion is that um, you should focus on getting more fans instead of more followers, you know? Yeah, and I mean, this this is the age-old debate, you know, how, how do you build a fan base? Mm-hmm. How do you get them to listen to your music? And then how do you get them to also come and experience your music? And you know what I mean? There, there's so many components to it. And I think... Over the years, the streaming platforms like Apple and Spotify have made more of an effort to work with managers and labels and artists in really activating with their fans. And, you know, we see that with, I think Apple and Spotify are both doing these great events and these, you know, physical activations that actually get fans in front of um, their favorite artists and stuff like that. And, you know, the fans' first initiative at Spotify, they, they directly pull the top fans on Spotify and bring them to special events. So, you know, there's definitely an awareness of that discrepancy. And, you know, I think for me, the thing that I find myself repeating the most is saying to people, you know, getting a million streams on Spotify is of course a good thing. And it's a great thing. And same with Apple music, but you've also got to be building an ecosystem outside of that. Uh, And there's, like I said, there's no, one size fits all thing. I think, you know, different genres and different territories, they 
they consume music in different ways and there are different cultural elements. So I think what it comes down to is working out what the priorities are for you as an artist or, you know, as a project or as a business even. Mm -hmm. And, you know, specifically tailoring goals around that rather than just assuming that anything you throw at Spotify can, you know, if you keep throwing singles at the streaming platforms, eventually you're going to start streaming higher and higher and higher. Because, yeah, you can do it that way. And quite frankly, I think that's been a few people's strategy over the years. Yeah, but yeah, it, it does help you build fans. You know what I mean? Um, a million streams won't sell a million tickets. Yeah. The yeah, that's, but that's the thing, you know, like having a million streams, I'm more interested in how many people you can actually convert into selling tickets because eventually that's the goal, you know, like the more people you can bring to a show, the more interesting you will be for a promoter. Absolutely. And the more money you'll make as well if we're, yeah. if we're looking at it from a business perspective. But yeah. yeah, no, so absolutely. So, I mean, like, I think that when people look at this and start trying to, you know, plan and strategize, mm -hmm. you need to, ha you need to have one overall strategy in terms of how you're going to build a fan base. And I think there are so many different elements to that, such as how you're active on social media, how your content, you know, becomes part of that strategy and what content resonates best with a, the people that are already fans and B the people that you want to be fans, mm -hmm. because this is the thing, you know, retention of a fan base is almost as tough as the initial garnering of a fan base. So, you know what I mean? It is, you can't make any assumptions. And just because it worked for one artist doesn't mean it's going to work for you. Yeah, and true. this thing, you know, I that's the sort of the one thing I often find. Somebody will come to me and say, hey, we want you to do what you did for insert client name here. And I'll say, oh, no, because that's been done. So <laughs> that doesn't yeah. mean it's going to work again, you know? Yeah. It's, uh, but this is the thing as well. We're... Um, Everybody sees all these big numbers. Everybody sees, you know, everybody wants to be in the playlist with the most followers and everybody wants, you know, to see the big digits. But as a result, people try and fast track the road to that. Yeah. And I can safely say that nothing worth having in this industry comes from fast tracking. And you look at the success of the chain smokers and you look at, you know, Kygo is a great example of that. It took a long fucking time. Don't get me wrong. There were periods where it went a lot faster but they really did the time and they invested the hours and they spent the time building a fan base i and still i actually still remember i i had quite a few email contact with him they sent me a lot of promos when i was still djing a lot before the whole big boom from the chase smokers they they sent out a lot of promos from my side and i i just got in contact with them never really i've never really noticed them mm -hmm. until closer and then things just yeah. boom for them, you know, like I know those guys were already working in the music industry for a way longer time, but that's the thing most people forget as soon as a hit comes out. It's just, oh, they just became famous because of this one hit. No, yeah. there's a way more deeper thing going on there. It's the iceberg complex. Yeah. People, you know, people see that thing at the tip, they see the latest point of trajectory and that's what they focus yeah. on. But yeah, it, it takes a long time to get there and, you know... I, I've, I heard a lot of people saying that, you know, if you really want to break an artist project, you know, it, we're looking at a three year minimum, I think, to really yeah. integrate them as, you know, a household name, let's say. And, and that takes time. You know, it really takes time. And I think, you know, if we're talking in terms of like dance music, like, you know, Swedish House Mafia was like a decade in the making, really. Yeah. If it wasn't for all the work they did as solo artists and then the subtle transition they made to being a group and then arguably what they did afterwards because that's become so important to this second chapter that's about to happen for Swedish House Mafia. You know, it's a long old timeline and, you know, they they put in the time. And a bit like I was saying earlier, anyone that's put in the time and weathered it out and, you know, let's face it, Dance music and EDM, as much as I hate that term, right now is not the hot commodity it was three, four years ago. True. But people are still riding it out and being true to the fan base they bought with them on that journey. Yeah. And you know, and uh, that's important. You know, I there was around the time the chain smokers were blowing up, I saw all these artists jumping ship on the big room sound and stuff like that, and going and making this future bassy pop sound. Yeah. And guess what? 
in doing that, a lot of the fans that came with them and knew them and adored them for the club music they were making and the experience of going to see that music at their shows, they jumped ship because suddenly it's like, you know, your favorite artist has sold out their values and is doing what everyone else is doing. And you know what? I bet they're selling a lot less fucking tickets now than they were back then. Yeah, so true. was it worth it for that few seconds of doing what everyone else is doing at the same it's, time? It's Absolutely a short, fucking not. No, it's a short term. It's a short term way of thinking, you know. Absolutely. So, so regarding the fan base building, because that's a main struggle for my clients, especially for people who are at the beginning of the whole uh, artist mm -hmm. career. You know, like, how do you get started? How do you get your first one thousand fans? Like, that's the the biggest leap for them. Uh, what's your favorite tactic regarding that? Like, what what would you what would you advise a starting artist? Work out who you think your fan base. Your, I mean, if we if we're talking. Starting from absolute scratch, like here's a project that nobody accepts. No, no, let's, mom let's knows just about. take an artist who already he's he had some releases, uh, maybe a release on Revealed or whatever. He had okay. he, he had his base, you know, but he just didn't pop, and he isn't capable of making a living out of music. Okay, so I think what he wants to do, or she wants to do, is identify who they think their fan base is and start talking to them. Like, you know, we are blessed with these social media tools, which, you know, the, the irony of them being called social media tools, where now it's become more of a communication platform for businesses, you know, that's a whole nother thing. But you can literally talk to your fans. You can literally reach out to them and speak to them. And you don't have to be there in person. You know what I mean? And I think you just need to get into that habit of talking and listening and never, never assume that you know what they want unless you've actually seen them say, and that can be through comments or from yeah. feedback, you know, whatever. Don't assume you know what they want, you know, and quite frankly, yeah, listen to them. Okay. You know, I think a good, a good brand isn't your dad. It isn't they're telling you what to do and how to live and do this. Like, I think a good brand just feels like part of your day-to-day -day life, and that can be applied to an artist because artists are making – Music and music as a commodity is something that people integrate into their day-to-day -day lives. Yeah, and quite frankly, you know, if you can't take the time to work out who your fan base is, then why the fuck should they take the time to work out who you are as an artist? You know what I mean? It goes yeah, both ways. True. Yeah, definitely. It's it's a two-way street. <laughs> and um, another point, which is a big struggle for 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 those like for those clients, is it's like it's it's probably the main question I get. Like, okay, I need to start. I know I need to start doing stuff on socials. That's the that's I know everyone gets that. You know, like yeah. But what should I post? That is the uh, the age old <laughs> question. I mean, hey, Marshmallow has a fucking cooking show. Yeah, Marshmallow has a cooking show that streams millions. Yeah. And if you'd have told me, you know, before Marshmallow was big, you know, like what what are his fans going to enjoy? If you'd have told me it was a cooking show, I'd have laughed in your face. But hey, it the, the proof's in the pudding. No pun intended. They, you know, people like watching Marshmallow cook. Yeah. And that, you know, and now, you know, I think Mo, if you want to go and look at somebody who really understands content, Marshmallow's manager, Mo Shazili, I think he is the the Gary V of music content because they are really good. Uh, his whole roster and him especially are really good at going and working out where their fan bases are and where they can, where they go and hang out, what they do, you know. And I think they just have this level of respect for that fan base and you know, tailoring content to those people. Mm -hmm. That should be the golden industry standard, but sadly it's not. So, so could but, you give an example of that the, the 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 thing that you just mentioned, like looking up where your fan base is and tailoring them the content they are looking for? So, could you give me yeah. an example of that? Well, I mean, I think in the first instance, to do that, you need to trial and error content mm -hmm. because, quite frankly, you know, just because. It's like I was saying, just because one format of content has worked for somebody that is similar to you as a brand or an artist doesn't mean it's going to work for you. Yeah. So I think you have, to, you have to be a little bit brave in the first instance and see what content works for you. And I think the best content is the kind of content that people consume without having to think too hard about it. You know what I mean? It's just content that's there that they slot it. And, like, you know, I, I have it now. 
if I'm flicking through my Facebook timeline or you know the video function, mm -hmm. I know if I if I see Gary Vee or if I see John Oliver, I stop because I that's the that's the format that I enjoy the most and I'm used to that sort of somebody talking and it being topical and that. But that probably bores the shit out of so many other people. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's uh, you know you're fighting for those split seconds of decision making attention in which somebody says yes. I am going to consume this content or yeah. no, I am not. And if you don't nail it in those first few seconds, they're gone. Whew, I'm saying it's like, yeah. it's like Tinder. You know it's, what I mean? It's probably it's even just, like milliseconds. It's just a swipe. Yeah. It's like, and it's, that's it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so you've got to, you've got to work out what works and you've got to make it as engaging and, you know, consuming as possible. Because, you know, like I say, the decision happens so quickly. Yeah. And if you're a new artist who doesn't have that, you know, obviously, if, if someone's a huge Rihanna fan and they see Rihanna's face pop up in those first seconds, like, they're going to stay because she's a household name yeah. and a, a huge recording artist. But as the new kid on the block, you don't have that uh, recognition. Mm -hmm. So you need to find a new way to engage them. Yeah. So if you, if you need to break it down, like, that's the way I like to do it as well. Trial and error, just try a lot of stuff, see what sticks, see what works, and then put in the concept of watching and learning what the community is telling you. So Exactly. See, ask fans. There are there are very subtle ways of asking fans if you're fucking up. You know what I mean? You can and you know, listen to your fan base. So I, I feel like I'm repeating myself, but so few people realize the importance of actually listening and putting your ear to the ground. Mm -hmm. When it comes to, you know, feedback and seeing what fans like and what they don't like. Yeah, but that's because you're vulnerable, you know, like if someone tells you your content sucks, that hurts. And some people have the proud in them to say like, no, it doesn't suck. Yeah. But if someone tells you, if like 10 people tell you it sucks and it doesn't have a lot of views, it probably sucks, you know, but they, they have all the proud in them, which, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, and when it comes to like the... The technical side of <clears throat> listening, there are so many ways to, you know, track how long people are consuming your content, where they're going after. You know, there's all these different retargeting sort of formats so that you can make sure that people are ending up at the right content or at least, you're, you know, diverting them back to relevant content when they do commit to that content. So, you know, on a marketing geek level, there's a lot more you can do. And like, I, I would personally save that conversation for somebody that lives and breathes that because I, uh, yeah. I only did my did my foot in that pond when I have to, to be completely honest. Okay. And where is your mind on the subject of monthly podcasts, weekly podcasts? Do you think they're still useful and how would you put that into the market right now? I think if you've really got enough content, rele you know, relevant, good quality content to be releasing content once a week, do it. If you've got enough to do it once a day, do it. But you've got to have that critical mind. Like, is the frequency worth it? You know, am I splitting up lots of views across separate videos in a week or, a, you know, a couple of weeks that actually would be more valuable targeted on a one hit, you know, monthly piece of content. Mm -hmm. And I think like, I think it comes down to it. If you really do have enough content, then weekly totally makes sense. And I mean, I think what you've also got to consider is, not just how you capture content, but then how you repurpose content. You know what I mean? Like it's Gary Vee's the king of this. That's his whole thing. He takes a long old keynote speech or something he's recorded or his podcast episode and he turns that into all this micro content. And that yeah. micro content is what feeds the social media and it's the micro content that um, then, you know, builds all the repertoire on social media and that and then mm -hmm. drives people to go and check out the full yeah, episode. That, so, that's for what example, it, that's what a call to actions are, are being placed in the micro. Exactly. So, quite frankly, if you can do it well enough in that you have one, maybe full length, long monthly edition of your podcast, mm -hmm. and then from that, you take enough, you know, micro content to keep your fan base topped up, to highlight the really important parts of it, mm -hmm. to keep the discussion going in between that. To me, that feels a lot healthier than trying to force weekly content where maybe you don't need it or maybe there just isn't enough scope. And, you know, it's it's time consuming. For every episode you're doing, you've got to edit video, edit audio, you know, get all the social media stuff right, you know, artwork. So it's 
it's a fair amount of work, right? Yeah. So I would say my, my default would be if you're talking as like this podcast is like a sideline thing, like it's not my nine to five destiny calling to be, mm. uh, you know, a weekly podcast guy. I think the monthly and having a solid micro content strategy is the one, to be honest. Yeah. I think that's great advice, you know, like, to me, I think a monthly podcast is definitely something you should do as an artist because it's another outlet, it's another way to to show your fans what you're all about and to give them, um, like, this this treat every month to, to yeah, to let them uh, enjoy your music and they, you can yeah. show them all the new stuff every month. Um, exactly. It's just, it's just a matter of, and to me, it's, it's, it's a matter of consistency as well, you know, like, if you just do things long enough people will start uh waiting for it you know if you if you launch a podcast every first monday of the month after mm. six or seven months people will start requesting like hey it's it's monday where's your where's your podcast absolutely consistency is key in all respects and uh, podcasting especially yeah you know and if uh and same with the content side you know if people are used to there being you know video elements that come with that podcast or that you know it's it's shared online in visual formatting and stuff, if you suddenly stop doing that, people are going to notice. And obviously, so much consumption happens on social media that, if anything, this the show can probably vary a little bit when it comes to the full the full length thing. But the way you're communicating that show and the way you're keeping that show visible to your fan base, that needs to be consistent at least in frequency. Yeah. Because, like you say, like the podcast market is having a little bit of a, a, a secondary boom again, it feels like now. And yeah. so you know, now, if you're an artist, and we're talking, you know, artists here, you're not only fighting like Tiesto and Hardwell and these guys that have huge syndicated shows already and have been doing it for a long time, and by the way, doing it really fucking well. Yeah. But you know, fi- you're now fighting Gary Vee and, you know, Tim Ferriss and all these big guys. And, you know, it's, uh, it's a competitive field. It's a really competitive field. So maybe the thing that's going to separate you is the content and the way that you keep the show in focus outside of those first two days where it's exciting and new and you know, it's like, Oh, the new episodes out. It's uh, it's that. And if you think about it, it's a month is a long time to keep people engaged. True. Yeah. But to me, a podcast is just an extra, you know, because as an artist, you have your releases going, you have your content that you're doing in the studio, or maybe you have this live show going on. You're touring stuff when you're on the way. I think as an artist, you, you can produce a lot of content and a podcast is just another part of the monthly stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. Um, I had a question. It's, it's kind of a pretty general and broad question, but I just had a question from someone on the live stream on Instagram. I'm not sure who it was anymore, but he asked, how do you create a marketing slash branding plan? And I, I guess this is like a big Big question, but could you narrow it yeah. down to a small, uh, like, decent answer? Okay. I think in the first instance, identify your market, mm-hmm. which sounds like the obvious thing to say, but, you know, just saying we want to be big in the dance music market, that's still pretty broad. You know what I mean? When yeah. you look at all the niche sort of sides to it, so identify your market, set brand values. You know, to work out what you stand for as a brand and what the experience of you as a brand means to the people that you want to engage. And then I think from there, once you started like, digging into that, setting those values, setting that, then you need to start working out, right, what is the experience of people coming to check this brand out and where where does this brand live? You know what I mean? Like, is, it, is this the brand that everybody's going to see at every festival in the next couple of years? Or is this the brand that's gonna be, you know, crossing over into all these big, you know, mainstream radio and uh, streaming playlists and stuff like that? And I think you need to start with an end in mind. I think so often people just sort of jump into it without really setting markets. Now, I, I think it's tough in this sort of, you know, climate to plan too far ahead. So what I like to say is rather than having like a sort of a five-year plan or like, you know, the business sort of more traditional, like longer term business plan. I think you've got to have a vision. Mm-hmm. You've just got to have a vision to say, this is where we're aiming to be. And the vision, it can be, it can be relatively broad. It doesn't have to be super specific. But then I think once you've set that vision, 
you need to be on a sort of a micro level, those first two, those, you know, the two years ahead, you need to be planning for that. You need to be saying like, right, these are the markers we're shooting towards and this is how we're going to get there. And this is what this marker means to that long-term vision we've set. Mm -hmm. And like, like I said, I think it's just comes down to start with an end in mind, go and identify those brand values, work out what marketing platforms are going to work best for that vision. And, and like I say, just don't make any assumptions. Yeah. The, the people that I think succeed now are one of two. They either go and do what people are already doing and fluke it and succeed, or they kind of set their own bar. They find a new, you know, they find a way to be creative and innovative in the way they market. And they, they do stuff that people wouldn't necessarily expect. Yeah. And as a result, they, you know, build momentum from that. And, you know, I'm not saying you have to reinvent the wheel every time, but if you can be the guy that manages to do something that impresses people and makes people think, okay, they are actually trying here, mm -hmm. then I think it's going to be long term an incredible asset to you. Cool. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, that, that's some, some great value that you gave here today. Like, I, I agree with a lot of stuff that you're saying. I think a lot of artists um, could learn from this especially on the marketing and the branding side. Um, so yeah, you know, I just wanted to thank you for taking the time to show all the people your knowledge and uh, the, the experience you've built in the last couple of years. Um, oh, it's a pleasure. Can people follow you somewhere? Like what's the, what's the main place you're active on right now? The main place I'm active on right now is Instagram. Okay. And uh, my handle there is Carter the Devil. Carter the Devil. I was actually looking you up. It's like, what? Did he, what kind of name does he has? Because I just looked on your original name. I didn't find something, and then yeah. like, Instagram suggested this one. It's like, is that him? It's like, yeah, yeah. That's him. I, you know what? I thought I was being clever because I thought it was the name of a book that I read, and then it turns out that wasn't even the name of the book. But now I've had that handle for so long. I just thought, well, you know That's what? I've better keep it. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, my bad. So if people <laughs> want to follow you, head over to Instagram, Carter the Devil. Cool. Absolutely. Thanks, man. Thanks for taking the time, and uh, I wish you the best of luck with your uh, brand new company. And uh, talk soon. My pleasure, man. Take it easy. You too. Bye. Hey guys, what's up? First of all, thanks for watching my content. Thanks for listening to the podcast and watching the videos. It means a world to me. Um, you guys have been hearing talking to me about coaching and personal coaching for a while now, but I just thought it was a good idea to show you some experiences of my clients to see what a personal coach and a mentor could do for you and your career. So here are a few user stories, client stories from my side. Hopefully it's useful to you. So what problem did I have? I got supported on CSS Club Life and I really didn't know like what to do or, or where to start. Uh, before this, yeah, like I, I went into so my social media strategies, blah, blah, blah. I posted like some things. Um, I made music. I've been doing music for four to five years. Um, and that was like, uh, uh, like, that was what I was doing. So I was like, this is a business. I really need to um, get help from someone that is knowledgeable enough and had, that has made it in the industry. I saw some videos of the coaching sessions uh, uh, from Joey. And I really liked them and yeah, I just approached him. He was really kind and really humble. And then we just started the coaching sessions. Coaching, I found out that you really need a solid plan and you need someone that is competent enough as Joey. So from his coaching sessions, um, I found out that it's really important to, to know what to do and to know like how the, the industry works. And the best person that can give you that advice is, is gonna be Joey. So number three, what specific part do you like the most? I like the part, how the classes work. The classes work very organically. They're, personally for me, I have at uh, the moment a one-to-one -one session. Um, I think Joey is super cool. He's super open to any questions that you have. He's always willing to help you. So that's the, the part that, you, that I like the most, the way the classes work. They're, they're very, very cool and I will recommend it to anyone. First of all, having a, a, lo a long-term, a mid-term and a short-term um, plan, that's very important knowing really how to network and third of all you'll be making um and or building the, those long-term relationships uh as you may know um the music industry is a is a business and we uh, communicate with other other people so it's really important to build relationships and joey has really teach me how how to do that i would really recommend uh, coaching to other artists it has been very very helpful for me personally um at the end now I'm starting to see uh, my music career as a, as a business 
And because of this, I'm, I'm like, of course, like you're, you're investing some budget for, for the classes, but I'm seeing in return uh, some results. So this is working for me. It has been a great experience. Um, I've been getting great results so far. So I, yeah, I would absolutely recommend it 21. It's one of the best decisions that I've made in my in career. Um, once again, I think the classes have been great. Um, I think you need someone that, that knows what he's doing, that has the experience that Joey has. So I would really recommend taking uh, the, the, the coaching sessions to other artists. Um, I found out that without the, what he has been telling me, I would be like wandering around for years. So yeah, now I have a solid plan and I know what to do.